in the various wards of the town, responsible and revocable at any time. This is important, responsible and revocable at any time. The majority of its members were naturally working people or acknowledged representative of the working class. The police, which until then had been the instrument of the government, was at once stripped of its political attributes and turned into the responsible and at all times revocable agent of the commune. So were the officials of all other branches of the administration. From the members of the commune downwards, the public service had to be done at workmen's wages. The privileges and the representation allowances of the high dignitaries of the state disappear, along with the high dignitaries themselves. The judicial functionaries lost their sham independence. They were, from this point forward, to be elected, responsible, revocable. In other words, the commune represented a very powerful form of democracy, which began to acquire certain direct features, features of direct democracy. It's not that they didn't have elected delegates or representatives, they had them, but the distance between those elected representatives and the masses themselves was drastically reduced. And if any person who had been elected as a delegate or representative proved in words on the or deed that he was not or she was not up to the job, this person could be rapidly uh, recalled. In other words, consider the experience we have in a capitalist democracy today. We vote for a senator, and then the, sen the, guy, the person goes to, to Washington for six years, maybe a year from her, or him, or not. This is the extent of democracy. You know, if if you, there's reasons to have uh, some kind of impeachment, it, the impeachment itself is some kind of awful and bureaucratic procedures for which there's no end in sight. Um, what the commune represented was the first step toward the reabsorption of the state back into society. The state didn't always exist. It emerged at a certain stage in social development, roughly 10,000 years ago. It then became a kind of a, a, a monstrous leviathan which, which has uh, independent function. The commune attempted practically to reabsorb it into society. Not that you didn't need uh, kind of structures of leadership and decision-making procedures, you did, and, and, and leaders do, but that the, the way in which it was worked out was uh, uh, far more democratic. There was a historical precedent for this as well. Uh, the democracies in Greece, in which the state was not a separate entity. Any citizen had the right to go into the assembly in Arabic case you want to go to war, very well, we're going to vote for it. Not our elected senators. It's going to be the people themselves who are going to have a chance and an opportunity to speak their piece about the war and vote for or against it. And then if the next day they change their mind, the next day we're going to have another assembly and we're going to vote differently. This is a form, a kind of a classical form of direct democracy, which the commune, in a certain sense, kind of grow, grow for toward. Uh, of course, there were many limitations and problems, both with the, the Greek democracy in particular, but the common as well. But this was a very significant attempt. As Lenin put it again, the commune represented the immediate introduction of control and superintendence by all, so that all shall become bureaucrats for a time, and so that therefore no one can become a bureaucrat. Another way of thinking about this, this was a state, yes, but a very different type of state, which in its very kind of everyday practice pointed toward a not so different, distant future in which it would be possible for it to wither away and be reabsorbed into the, the ordinary functions of society, in which you don't need a cop to tell someone not to do this or not to do that, and you don't need a standing stand army, army if you need to do defend yourself. Now, the commune, uh, as I said, was crushed. As a matter of fact, uh, the very uh, physical kind of structures of Paris as a, as a city were fundamentally altered to erase the historical memory of the commune. That had happened even earlier in the 1848 revolutions, but obviously the ruling class wanted nothing to do 
but the memory of the commune continued and uh, the Soviets emerged later in Russia in 1905 in particular as a new, and I will say improved, uh, a manifestation of, of the first attempt of the commune. What were the similarities between the Soviets and the commune? The Soviet only means it sounds scary because we've been taught that it's supposed to be scary, but really it means council. There's nothing scary about that. Uh, so, yeah. Now these uh, Soviet souls, they were republics, right? Eventually, yeah. Now what was that supposed to be all about? I'll explain. Okay. Um, the similarities between the Soviets and the, and the commune is that they were both institution of rule and representation that fused together executive and legislative function. As they said, a working body, not a parliamentary body. Power was in the commune and in the Soviets and flowed through that alone. It wasn't scattered in a series of separate institutions, each with their own specific, specific functions, each removed substantially by the actual will of the people. Second, the commune, like the Soviets, functioned through a system of elections and immediate recall. Again, you couldn't eliminate delegates altogether, but you could maximize the democratic content of the institutions. Also like the commune, the Soviets were class institutions created to represent working people, not generic, abstract citizens. I believe that embryonically, this intuition is already present in the Occupy movement. That's why you say, you know, it's not 100%. It's 99%. You know, the 1% is a, it's not some kind of minutia. It's not the spare change of history. The 1% is exactly what stands between us and the attainment of, a, of, a, of a, a genuine political and economic democracy. So the commune and the Soviets very deliberately and cautiously excluded the landowner, the hedge fund manager, the banker from their representation. These were institutions of class representation. It wasn't a question of inclusion in a generic kind of uh, moralistic sense. It was a matter of fighting a class struggle effectively. So the point of the Soviets was not just for working people to control. Uh, I guess I guess uh, I should mention the way in which the Soviet represented. I would say an improvement from the communist is that the Soviet was generated and really fundamentally out of the workers. Massive factories began to form their own Soviets, which would be represented. So when people debated and discussed democratically, they weren't doing it on the basis of a generic and abstract citizenship, which could mean a whole host of very different and, in fact, incompatible things. You know, the hedge fund manager is a citizen, and you're a citizen, except he rules and you don't. More concretely, uh, the, the Soviet expressed the, the kind of the, the political independent, independence of labor itself in the geographic location in which it operates. Every uh, workplace was supposed to be run democratically. And that was the, the, the massive kind of uh, 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 improvement, so to speak, that the Soviets introduced. Now, of course, this is simplifying that were other uh, organizations and institutions, uh, 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 factory shop uh, committees, a whole host of things, but we'll, we'll keep it a little bit more uh, managed. <coughs> and I'm almost done. The, uh, the other thing that's important to think about in, in terms of the Soviet, the Soviet becomes, you know, again, it begins in the workplace, Massive factory might elect a delegate, then send a delegate to a higher body of representation, a citywide Soviet, and then from then you can go to a regional Soviet, and then from then to an all national Soviet. This becomes a very impressive structure of rule and representation that begins from the bottom and is encapsulated in a kind of a national government, quite literally, of working people. Um, the way in which this function, I think it must be understood, is that, of course, there were different tendencies and different political positions. Um, some people were anarchists, and some people were moderate socialists, to keep, it, to keep it simple. Other people were revolutionary socialists. All of these tendencies found 
play and representations within the Soviet structure. In other words, when people were discussing, they weren't discussing on the basis of their own kind of independent subjective whim that today I feel like this and we're going to talk about this. But opinions were kind of crystallized and formulated along the lines of a few basic positions as to where we should be going as a society. This was not done by force. It's not as if the socialist, a socialist party would just impose its own will. It's just that as a product of the political maturation of the situation in Russia, uh, various working class constituencies uh, spontaneously oriented themselves toward this party as opposed to that. And when there were debates and deliberations in the Soviets, quite often the working class, class tendencies played a very important role. The key was not to pretend that different opinions and tendencies did not exist, but to air them out openly and democratically, debating and finally deciding by a majority. Again, notice, however, that the parties that functioned in the Soviet as a parliament, in that sense, were working class parties. They didn't invite the cadets, the constitutional democrats. They didn't invite the uh, Black Hundreds fascistic uh, fellows that were getting organized in Russia. This is working class parliament. That means you have to be a, a, a working class tenant to, uh, and of course more could be said about these kinds of institutions, but the last one I feel is the most important. If we are thinking about the situation in terms of the future and present of the uh, occupied movement, uh, I began by noting that it seems fair to say that it developed as a result of great frustration with capitalist economics and capitalist politics. But to this day, this frustration remains an implicit tendency. And in some cases, here and there, the movement drifts toward being reabsorbed by the existing political establishment. So people might go to the city council and ask, well, you know, why don't you do something for us? Or a member of the city council might show up and throw at you all sorts of very uh, wonderful phrases about we're here to work with you, by which they mean actually that we're here to work with you so long as you sooner or later work your way back into the framework of ordinary capitalist politics. So with this in mind, and this is the last thing I'll say, then maybe we can have a few names. We should look to the historical experience of the Soviets, not so much because it offers a ready-made set of institutions and procedures, but because it represents the basis for the most important thing of all, that is to say, the political independence of the working class. Not as an abstract principle, but as a living reality. And I can, I can translate this in a little bit more direct language depending on what the questions are. But I think this is the most important reason to even have, have that particular So that's, that's there. I would like to thank you for coming here and not using the ism word or the uh, IST endings to any of your statements, uh, like communist, anarchist or any of the ism words which create a separatism between its people um, everything you said was about we the people of the movement in russia here um, we need to take the eyes out of everything and become we and ism starts with an eye or is starts with an I. When you take that I out of the equation, it becomes we. Uh, and I want to thank you well, for that. I thank you for your, uh, can I respond? Uh, I, I, I hate to be a killjoy about this, but actually, in a certain sense, the spirit of, of what I said went in, the, in a different direction. Right. And I'll, I'll just say a couple of things. When one mentions these isms, and it's not some kind of affectation of the intellectual, some kind of making things more complicated than they ought to be. The question is not the issue of this ism or that ism, but 
for working people to figure out very concretely what isn't they need. Because, look, there's, again, I, 